Listen up. You're smart. You've grinded through computer science classes and built a bunch of impressive projects. You've competed in hackathons, done research, grinded leak code. But here's what's driving you absolutely insane. You still can land your dream software engineering job. Now, if you're thinking, I'm on. Easy for you to say. You landed six internships and multiple six-figure offers. You're probably some coding genius. But let me burst that bubble real quick. I completely bombed the APCS exam in high school. I got a one out of five. A one. I'm definitely not some prodigy who's naturally smarter than you. So here's a million dollar question. Why are people who seem way less qualified than you consistently landing jobs while you're refreshing your empty inbox? The answer comes down to something way deeper than you think. Something that a Nobel Prize winning economist discovered that completely changed how we understand success and failure. And once you understand this principle, everything about job hunting will finally make sense. I'm going to show you the exact system I've used to help hundreds of students transform from unemployable to landing their dream offers. But fair warning, this is going to challenge everything you think you know about getting hired. Let's dive in. Here's something that's going to blow your mind. Being good at coding has almost nothing to do with getting coding jobs. I know that sounds completely backwards, but stick with me. Back in the 1980s, there was a Nobel Prize winning economist named Robert Solo, who noticed something completely bizarre. See, companies were pouring billions of dollars into computers, expecting massive productivity gains. Everyone was convinced that this technology would revolutionize business overnight night. But when Solo looked at the actual results, he found something shocking. He said, you can see the computer age everywhere, but in the productivity statistics. All of that investment, all of that cutting edge technology and productivity barely budged. And that's exactly what's happening to you right now. You're pouring everything into becoming a coding wizard, writing algorithms, building side projects, mastering frameworks. But all of that input is not converting into any output, which are job offers at the end of the day. I call this the developer's dilemma. This is the gap between how good you are versus how good you seem to be to the market. During my sophomore year, I watched this play out in real time. There was a student in my algorithms class, let's call him Derek. Derek could implement red black trees from memory. He had contributed to open source and built a machine learning model that actually worked. Pure technical genius. And then there was this other student. Her name was Jessica. She was decent at coding, but nothing special. Her projects were simpler. Her GitHub looked pretty basic compared to Derek's. At the end of the day, guess who got the Microsoft internship? It was Jessica. And it's because Jessica understood something that Derek didn't. Companies don't hire you based on your actual skills. They hire you based on how well you can communicate and demonstrate those skills. Derek had incredible input, yet Jessica had mastered the output. But here's where it gets really interesting and why most people stay stuck. Most computer science students think like this. No, oh, I need to learn more Java, build another full stack app, maybe master system design and add some AI to my resume. And then job offers will fall from the skies and magically appear in my lap. That's only half the equation. And that's the half that everybody obsesses over. Think of job hunting like this. There are two buckets you need to fill. Bucket number one is called the input bucket. These are your technical skills, your algorithms knowledge, your programming knowledge. This is where 95% of students dump all of their energy. And the second bucket is called the output bucket. And this is how those skills show up where it actually matters. Some of the stuff in the output bucket are your resume, your interview performance, your personal brand, your networking skills. And here's the truth. I've seen mediocre engineers with strong output buckets land amazing jobs where brilliant engineers who have all the inputs, I mean, they have great algorithms, knowledge, technical skills, programming languages, but they're weak at the output, stay unemployed for months. You know those big tech YouTubers you watch? Names like Nama Kapoor, Sajad Khader, me, Nikode, a life engineered. These are great engineers, sure, but none of us are the greatest engineers alive. The truly elite programmers are buried in code, building incredible systems you'll never hear about. The difference is that all of us figured out the output game. We understand how to turn technical skills into visibility, interviews, and opportunities. It's like being the world's best home chef, but having no idea how to get hired at a restaurant. You've got the skills, but you can't capture the opportunity because you don't understand the hiring system. So here's the question that changes everything. Which of these two buckets are you completely neglecting. And most people know the answer immediately. And that's where we need to start digging deeper. See, here's where most people mess up. They work hard. They understand both of these buckets, but they're not diagnosing their real problem. See, your job search is like an iPhone. You could have the latest model, the most insane camera, every app downloaded. But if your battery is dead, that phone is just an expensive paperweight. That dead battery is your bottleneck the one thing that quietly sabotages everything else. And when I started helping students with their job search, I noticed something fascinating. 
there are really only two places people get stuck, and figuring out which one is you changes the whole game. Now, the first place people get stuck is what I call the interview desert. About 75% of students are stuck here. They've submitted hundreds of applications, 200, 300, maybe even over 500 applications, yet they've only had two to three real interviews. If that sounds like you, then getting interviews. The interview desert is your bottleneck. Not passing them, not negotiating offers, just getting your foot in the door. And the number one reason, I hate to be brutal, is probably because your resume is absolutely terrible. I've reviewed hundreds of software engineer resumes, and most are genuinely bad. But here's the crazy part. When we fix them, students literally double their interview rate. It's insane to witness. Your resume is you to an employer before they ever meet you. It needs to be absolutely perfect. Here's what's killing your resume right now. The first thing is what I like to call the experience mirage. You're listing projects and hackathons as hobbies instead of positioning them as legitimate work experiences. If you have fewer than three work experiences on your resume, that's your problem. Everything you've done, volunteering, leadership roles, even substantial projects, needs to sound like professional technical work. The next mistake is what I call the seven second death. Recruiters spend less than seven seconds scanning your resume. Resume. Seven seconds. If they can't immediately understand that you fit the role, you're dead in the water. For internships, that means education at the top, clearly showing you're a student. Next up, we have the hobby trap. Nobody cares about your Netflix preferences or weekend D&D sessions. Again, this isn't a dating profile. You want to cut all the non-technical fluff so your valuable experience can actually shine. And then we have the weak numbers problem. You're terrified to use impressive metrics, but who's reading your resume? It's not the CEO, it's someone in HR looking at 50 resumes before lunch. A line like optimized user experience for 100 million plus register app users hits way harder than fix the bug. And then we have the keyword drought problem. Companies use bots to scan for Python, AWS, JavaScript, and React in other technical terms. So you need to maximize technical keywords you can reasonably defend. But that's not even the biggest issue with the interview desert trap. The biggest issue is that your LinkedIn is just decoration. Most people slap their LinkedIn link on their resume and start praying. LinkedIn is an absolute networking weapon when used right. You should be connecting with 50 to 100 people every single week at target companies. Or you're not getting referrals. This is a secret sauce that nobody discusses. Referred candidates are seven times more likely to get offers. Only five to 10% of applicants have referrals yet 30 to 50% of hires do. Yet most people, again, have less than 10 referrals total. So these three steps are how you solve the interview desert. But what if you're getting interviews and still failing? That's a completely different problem, which I like to call the conversion crisis. And roughly 15 to 20% of people are here. They're getting interviews, but can't convert them into offers. And the first problem in the conversion crisis is your lead code ability and approach is completely broken. Most people just jump between problems without any sort of strategy and copy solutions when stuck. Lead code is like the gym for CS majors. You need consistent targeted practice, five to 10 problems per week minimum. Or another problem people face is they literally have no interview skills. So even though they can code, they can't actually show that off in an interview. Solving problems alone in your room is completely different from explaining your approach out loud, handling ambiguous requirements, or whiteboarding cleanly. Or next, you're bombing behavioral interviews. Most students struggle more with the question, tell me about a time you overcame a technical challenge, than with leak code and coding questions. Some companies literally only do behaviorals. You need compelling stories with specific metrics and clear frameworks. But here's what's really interesting, and this is the part most people never hear about. Beyond all this technical stuff, there are a bunch of invisible behaviors I like to call self-sabotage problems that keep people unemployed, and you're probably doing at least one of these. The first one is called the readiness trap. If you've ever thought to yourself, I need more skills, just one more project. This is procrastination disguised as preparation. I landed my first software engineering internship as a freshman knowing basically nothing. It's about strategy, not perfection or the give up too soon problem. You apply to five jobs, get one rejection and take it personally. See, I'm not good enough. I'm gonna quit software engineering. Rejection is part of the math. If you minimize applications, you minimize your chances. Or people play the blame game. The market is terrible, companies are biased. If you never take accountability, you guarantee you'll never improve. You become a victim instead of a problem solver. Or the lone wolf complex. I don't want help. If someone refers me, it doesn't count. Pure ego. You avoid networking while wondering why nothing changes. Here's what changed everything for me. I asked for help constantly. I sought out mentors and understood that getting knowledge from others is invaluable. Here's the ultimate truth. You need to understand that you're not dumb and this isn't about luck. I've seen people who are definitely less smart than you landing massive six-figure jobs right now. The difference is not intelligence, it's understanding the system. Remember Solo's discovery? It's not about how many skills you stack up, it's about whether those skills convert into job offers. Now, if you want our help to stop chasing inputs and actually chase outputs, if you want us to help you avoid all of these problems here, 
help you pass interviews and get interviews where we guarantee you'll get the outcome, check out the Software Engineering Accelerator. It's a top link in the description and you'll work directly with me along with my team of FANG recruiters and engineers to land your dream job or internship. And if you want more help actually building a good resume, click this video over here. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you in the next video.